Hello everyone and welcome to this edition of Inside the Naval Postgraduate School. From the beautiful Rose Garden here on the campus of NPS in Monterey, California, I'm your host Alan Richmond right here on the Pentagon Channel. Thanks for joining us. Well, coming up in this episode of Inside NPS, we'll look at the Joint Interagency Field Exploration down at Camp Roberts, California. We'll look at off-road cart research and a new UAV called Puma. We'll also visit with an EOD officer who happens to be an NPS student on explosive remnants of war collection points. First, we all know we live in a world, of course, of acronyms, and JIFX is just but yet another of them, J-I-F-X. Aha, what does it mean, you ask? Well, we're on the road again and out in the field with Ray Bittner from NPS to find out. Welcome to JIFX. Yeah, uh, JIFX is Joint Interagency Field Exploration, and it's the result of a research proposal we provided to the Office of Secretary of Defense, at &L, uh, suggesting that we take the successful TNT program that we conduct for the special operations community, take that same model that has been going on since 2002 here at the Naval Postgraduate School, and adjust that to the needs not only of the special operations community, but the joint warfighter and the interagency community that supports our combatant commanders around the globe. Well, as in many cases, it's all about collaboration. Who comes to GIFIX and who's involved? So uh, the main leads out here at, at GIFIX uh, and the folks that that OSD sponsors us to support are the combatant commander s and representatives. So uh, the combatant commanders around the globe, the U.S. has geographical combat commanders, uh, Central Command, which are the folks who are fighting the current wars, Pacific Command, which with our pivot to the Pacific Theater, their vast AOR covering the largest percentage of the globe of any of the combatant commanders uh, is supported by our work here. Uh, at home, NORTHCOM is out here uh, looking for, for ways they can better protect the homeland as their mission and a few uh, regions in the Caribbean basin that fall under their responsibility. So we're really reaching out to, to provide an integrating mechanism, if you will, where they can come and see a lot of ex exploration, a lot of technologies. Now, there's more than 50 experiments right now. We've got more than 70 companies and, uh, and other non-federal agencies. So we put this mix together just like we were successful with TNT for those combat commanders so they can get a very rich understanding of where capability might take them and those technology providers can understand the requirements that those combat commanders have. So if we can shorten that gap, we'll have more effective lower risk acquisition eventually and get better things to those warfighters and first responder warfighters uh, more quickly and more efficiently. So really, as in many cases with research at NPS, it's about collaboration and communication, isn't it? It's interesting that many of these companies are technology and collaboration companies from a technological perspective, but there aren't many um, events that allow them to collaborate to this level uh, with, with the technology and about the technology. You know, a, a trade show or a, or a straight demonstration doesn't allow them to, to take things in the field in 100 degree temperatures as we have now and uh, work with six other companies that have capabilities that enhance their technology. And we've had uh, great examples out here this time from uh, big companies like Boeing and Lockheed Martin working together uh, to little companies that you know, have five, ten people, uh, all sharing technology, working together to solve each other's problems. And the bottom line is it really supports national security and focuses on solutions for the warfighter, right? The environment we create out here is intensely collaborative. So folks have to be free to explore or play with new concepts and new ideas. And as we uh, try to do that, the warfighter in this case sometimes is that National Guardsman, sometimes it's the firefighter or the Emergency Operations Center person. Well, as always, special thanks to NPS professor Ray Bittner and to all the researchers who do such important work in the field in support of the warfighter. Well, stay with us coming up after the break. We'll look at explosive remnants of war collection points with an NPS EOD officer. Stay with us. Well, while we were on the road down at Camp Roberts, California in the field, we happened upon an NPS EOD officer by the name of Luke Cummings. And Luke has a project called Explosive Remnants of War Collection Points, and it's certainly in support of the warfighter. I am Lieutenant Deward Cummings. I am currently finishing my research for my Explosive Remnants of War Collection Point project here at the Naval Postgraduate School under the Defense Analysis Special Operations Irregular Warfare Curriculum. Well, Lieutenant, we always like to follow our NPS alum, and I'm wondering if you can start off by telling us a little bit about the time you were at the Naval Postgraduate School. 
Coming to MPS was actually um, a unique opportunity for, for me because I'm an EOD officer. Getting into defense analysis and doing the special operations irregular warfare uh, curriculum uh, was great. It just fits so well into, into what we do in the field you know, on a, on a daily basis, which is, is beyond the scope of, of the normal special forces guys that, that go through the program. And it, it gave me a great opportunity to take a, a problem set that I had uh, when I was out operating to an academic environment and, and look at it through that lens, uh, find a solution for it, and then uh, get it back out to the field as, as quick as I could. So can you describe your project and your thesis work for us? So anywhere in the world that there has been conflict, there is something left over from that conflict. And in a generalized term, it's called explosive remnants of war. That's bullets uh, laying on the ground, anti-personnel mines, um, mortars, RPGs, any, anything you can think of, small arms, light weapons, anti-personnel mines, landmines, anti-tank mines, the, that whole spectrum of ordnance um, is, all, is all left over somewhere, whether it's in an active weapons cache or uh, it's, it's pulled off of an IED uh, after the IED has been disrupted. Um, that's all considered explosive remnants of war. It's all a hazard is what it, it boils down to. And when I was operating in the field, I did uh, quite a bit. I did some humanitarian demining missions. I'm an EOD guy, so by trade, it is my job to dispose of ERW when we find it, when we're called to it. Um, so I've done it for, for many years, and I kept running into a common theme. Um, finding it is, is not the issue. That happens inadvertently every day, unfortunately, a lot of times. Um, what the problem is, is finding a way to quickly dispose of it. It'd be great if we could go all over the world and simultaneously dispose of all the ERW, but that's just not realistic. So once something is found, it has to be stored while it waits for disposal. That's where the issue is. There, there was a, a capabilities gap um, to basically collect and store small amounts of ERW um, and the, the optimal situation would be don't touch it. And that's what you preach as an EOD guy, as a humanitarian deminer. Don't touch it, mark it, report it, we'll come take care of it later. That's where the other capabilities gap comes from. We can't do that all the time. And that local farmer Whoever's trying to utilize that piece of land or that area simply can't wait weeks or months or even days um, for us to come out or that local authority to come out and try to dispose of it for him. So as much as we would like him not to, they're going to pick it up and they're going to move it. And I'd much rather have them pick it up and move it to a known collection point than walk up to the village elder or a uniformed security personnel, whoever, whatever the case is, and say, here's a piece of ordinance, please take care of this for me. Um, that's, that's the worst case scenario. Um, so if these guys are going to pick it up, which the reality is that they do, as much as we would like them not to, um, they're going to pick it up. If they're going to pick it up, they need to be able to store it somewhere and secure it so it doesn't become uh, a precursor or, or basically what what it does is it enters the IED cycle. It, it starts to become part of the IED uh, process. Um, or it sits out in the open and continues to, uh, to um, degrade and becomes more and more sensitive as it is as it, as, as exposed to the elements. I'm wondering if you can tell us step by step the process of how you actually build this device. Um, so the, the process has to be simple. Um, in order for it to be adopted and implemented and used by that local population, um, it needs to be as easy as it can be. Nobody likes to do extra work. Uh, so you begin with clearing a, a nice level spot, um, and then you essentially are building a core and then a shell around that core with a reinforcement of some kind um, in the middle. And it's, it's a really simple process. You're using fiber reinforced material. So the acquisition of the material, that's all pre-hand. You, know, you, you, you do that before you, you get to, uh, 
to building your structure. Um, but the methodology is the same regardless of what you're using, whether you're using tires as your reinforcement or bamboo or just plain sticks, woven sticks together. Um, whatever that local population has used for centuries to build whatever structures they have, you're essentially reinforcing that with fiber, uh, with fiber reinforced concrete. Um, and you're doing it in a, in a cylinder. That's, that's really all you're doing. There's a placement method that's no different than building an adobe wall where you build six to eight inch layers at a time as you go up you let it sit for a couple of hours come back build another layer come back build another layer and it just goes up and when you get to the right height you you stop and then there's a poured method um, which you see gets the the nice smooth sides but uh, this one that we're looking at right here that was built level by level and then the outside was just smoothed off and inside this one is just hemp net so you build your core level by level and then you wrap it in your reinforcement which in this case is is hemp net or jute net netting and then you seal all that up with another layer and then you cap it off with a lid that's made in the same same design so once you get the structure up you let it set and you let it cure and uh, as soon as it is cured depending on your weather conditions, it's ready for ordinance to go in it, or ERW to go in it right away. Well, yesterday was certainly a big day with the demonstration that you provided to a pretty big audience and a lot of the COCOMs were here to witness this. How were you feeling about that? Well, I was obviously very nervous because I, I was hoping everything was gonna work well. Burn a hole, burn a hole, burn a hole! And it, it could not have gone better. It absolutely went as, as, as good as it could have gone. We hit all of our design requirements and, and the parameters were, were all met. Um, and it just, it's great that, that it happened in front of everybody. Um, and and that's, that's why we're here. That's what GIFIX is for. And that's what uh, NPS puts on events like this is for is to bring those folks who normally wouldn't have the opportunity to see this and not necessarily be involved in all the research and the development and, and that process. They get to come see the end product and if they like what they see, they have the authority to say, implement this as, as quick as we can. How do you feel knowing that this technology and your project, the end result of your project, is actually going to be going back to the front line in support of the warfighter, in many cases, uh, first responders? And, and not so much the guys, but it's, it's the indigenous populations that the guys are out there trying to help. Those regions that are trying to stabilize, but they can't for a whole slew of reasons. But one of the variables is if you've got a minefield, you can't plant your crop, you know, as an example. Um, and with the demining efforts and, and a lot of that stuff, there, there simply isn't the full spectrum of, okay, we can dispose of this stuff immediately and get the process going. There's, there's a whole slew of variables that are really hard to get into, you know, in, in, in this, this venue. But essentially what this is doing is it's providing an interim solution, that it's filling that capabilities gap that, that existed. And if we can get that done, then, then it's been a success. Well, that's a pretty unique story and situation, having been on the front lines and then back to an academic environment, solve the problem, and then take it back to the front lines again. I'm just wondering, what's the way ahead? What's the next step? Venues just like GIFIX. Um, it is, it's anybody who's been involved with acquisitions or the approval process of getting anything out in the field understands how difficult it is. For me to come from the field to NPS, do my research, do my thesis, and then have the opportunity to stay on and go after and do what I'm doing now, which is essentially fielding it. And GIFIX provides that platform for the COCOMs to come look at what we're doing. Um, other international aid organizations, all the people that need to be involved in, in helping to resolve the ERW problem, they can come here, they can see this, solution firsthand and uh, the turnaround is incredible uh, it's going to be 24 months from me coming from the field with a problem finding a solution and then getting that solution out to the guys out to the warfighters um, within 24 months is is pretty impressive and that's all all part of the the nps process 
Well, as you know by now, NPS collaborates with many different agencies and institutions, and one of them happens to be Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Here's Dr. Lorenz. At the High Explosives Application Facility, we develop explosives and explosives formulation for the national nuclear mission um, of the stockpile, and we also develop explosives for work for others. For example, under Memorandum of Understanding for the Department of Defense. It's been in existence, the High Explosives Application Facility, for about uh, 20 years. So it's a new facility, a cutting edge for the nation. This work is for the, in cooperation with the Naval Postgraduate School to develop um, an explosives remnants of war um, containment uh, capability. It's um, a new kind of work for us because it's having to do with blast effects, non-traditional explosives work. We generally deal with um, ideal high explosives work. Um, this is uh, a little bit different in terms of mitigating blast in a very, um, uh, non-traditional environment. But NPS came to us um, asking about some help and we have some capabilities at the High Explosives Application Facility, um, cutting edge diagnostics, high speed cameras, uh, blast gauges, contained firing facilities, a lot of things that are not typically available at other places around the country. So they came to us and we were very happy to help them. The partnership is fantastic. Um, it's uh, a long-standing partnership. Um, the work comes and goes. It's a, there's a lot of different uh, projects that come about every year. This is a new project and we welcome it because it's got such um, impact for our forces around the world. And it was particularly interesting when it was presented to us. And it was a new kind of project so we could study blast effects um, and it's, it's new work for us. We're lo always learning at the High Explosive Application Facility, so when a new project comes along, it excites the workers, it excites the, the um, investigators, and um, it benefits our, our partners at NPS. Well, we'd like to thank everybody who is involved in this very important, supportive project of the Warfighter down at Camp Roberts. Well, coming up next, research into Puma. You'll not want to miss that. Also, you know you can get the latest news and information on the Naval Postgraduate School as it happens through the university's official Twitter site. Follow NPS and stay connected and stay informed at twitter.com slash NPS Monterey. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. Well, UAVs play a huge role in supporting the warfighter. And while we were at Camp Roberts, we got an update on Puma with Martin Cowley. So the Puma uh, is a UAV system manufactured by AV. It's the largest of our family of UAVs uh, that are small, portable, rugged, uh, and hand launchable. So the Puma is approximately 10 foot wingspan, weighs 13 pounds, and, and can fly for uh, just over two hours. Uh, the normal payload that a Puma carries is a camera payload. It carries an EO camera, an IR camera, and a laser illuminator. And this is a gimbaled camera, so it can look around in all directions during flight. Uh, for this particular exercise uh, today, uh, we have installed a, an additional modular payload, which is a communication relay, so that it will allow uh, dispersed ground forces with handheld radios that may no longer be in contact because of terrain features or because of distance. Okay. They're no longer in connectivity. If we put the Puma up with a communication relay, it will re-establish link for them. Uh, we've done this on many occasions over the last couple of years on military frequencies, and, and this time uh, at the relief exercise, this is the first time that we've used uh, the civilian emergency uh, response, first responder uh, band of uh, radio frequencies. Boeing also plays a role with Puma. We have come to a TNT event here before with a, a unit that was uh, programmed for military frequencies, and that unit went directly from TNT of May of 2011 into theater. It's been there for 14 months uh, supporting active evaluation and actual missions. They are never going to send it back, is the word that we've got. So uh, we produced more military units, but this particular unit is modified to work with civil frequencies to provide uh, connectivity for handheld radios for first responders and emergency where they don't have connectivity because of hills and uh, urban structures and things like that. So the UAV is a tremendous tactical, small tactical UAV that can de be deployed practically out of a trunk 
is a tremendous asset because it's like being able to launch your own personal satellite and putting a communication relay in it, but for, for instantaneous use and whether it's military or civilian use. Well, from UAVs, time to do a little off-roading. Come on along. Well, this, we're part of the JAWIC, the Joint Information Operation Warfare Center, and our branch is the JAWIC Vulnerability Assessment Branch. And uh, what we are do, we're funded to test the vulnerabilities of systems and act as a red team. So we stress the system, let the vendor know what their issues might be so that they can fix them, those problems in the development process to avoid costs, you know, uh, mitigations to the warfighter, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this, is, this is one of our platforms. We have several here on site with us. And it has the capability right now to uh, provide or simulate system-on-system -system interference. Um, it's more mobile, and it, but we can suite out any of our, our equipment with the rack here so it can be used for other things as well. Inside we have um, several uh, RF ampl amplifiers and uh, signal generators to create our own signal and boost the power. And we hook them up to the antennas and depending on the frequency range will uh, you know, uh, transmit that signal towards the intended target. There's also a spectrum analyzer in there to monitor the RF spectrum. And then once we locate it, then we'll you know, hook up the uh, signal and the amplifiers. We modified it and put over, uh, it, you know, it's a commercially available piece of gear, but we made our, our modifications, all the back stuff, added about a little over a thousand pounds of, with modifications and equipment. And those 2K Honda generators power everything on there. Basically, it's used as a test vehicle for equipment, um, and it's been in operation about, about two years now, um, and we'll we can go anywhere. We've operated on, you know, the sand. We've operated up the mountains of, over here in, in uh, Camp Roberts. Basically, a more mobile platform that our bigger 450, our bigger instrumentation vehicles can't get to, to, to emulate that, uh, you know, mobile red team adversary. Well, Justin, thanks very much for that off-road adventure. Well, coming up next, it's the NPS Spotlight, and this time it falls on distinguished NPS professor Dr. Nancy Hagel, who was recently awarded a Fulbright Scholar Award for research and lecturing for her work in near-field scanning optical microscopy. Her work will take her to Hebrew University in Israel, where she'll have the opportunity to work and learn from the head of the Department of Applied Sciences, Professor Aaron Lewis, a world-renowned expert and a pioneer in near-field imaging techniques. Congratulations to Dr. Nancy Hagel. Well, as we close the show today, we want to thank you for joining us. And on a somber note, we'd like to salute two gentlemen who had a big role in NPS history and the NPS community. Rear Admiral Robert McNitt passed away peacefully on Sunday, August 12th at his home in Annapolis, Maryland. He was 97. McNitt served as superintendent of the Naval Postgraduate School from 1967 to 1971. He completed a detailed program of study in physics and ordnance engineering at NPS before finalizing requirements for Master of Science degree in mechanical engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. After a year aboard the heavy cruiser Chicago and three years as chief engineer of the destroyer Rhind, McNitt completed five successful World War II war patrols as executive officer of the submarine Barb, receiving two Silver Star medals. Upon completing his studies at NPS and MIT, he served as gunnery officer in the aircraft carrier Midway and helped design the Navy's first underwater atomic weapon at the Naval Ordnance Laboratory. McNitt is credited for inspiring many young men and women throughout his naval career, including a Southern California high school student named Mike Mullen, who would become the first NPS alumnus to serve as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and acknowledged McNitt's role of his success during his induction speech into the NPS Hall of Fame. Admiral James D. Watkins passed away on Thursday, July 26th at his home in Virginia at the age of 85. A 1958 mechanical engineering graduate of the Naval Postgraduate School, Watkins went on to become Chief of Naval Operations, Secretary of Energy, and later a member of the University's Hall of Fame. Following a highly decorated 37-year naval career, Watkins was asked by then-President Ronald Reagan to lead the embattled Presidential Commission on AIDS in 1987, for which he was widely praised.
He also served as Secretary of Energy under President George H.W. Bush and is considered one of NPS's most notable alumni. On the heels of decades of service to the Navy, Watkins found a new passion in our world's oceans. He served as Chairman of the Commission on Ocean Policy and was deeply committed to advancing fishing and anti-pollution regulations and decreasing dependence on foreign oil. His memory lives on in the halls of the Naval Postgraduate School and in Watkins Hall, the building named in his honor. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Inside NPS. From Monterey, California, I'm your host, Alan Richmond. We'll see you next time.